Mr. Paul Farrington, how are you, pal? Mate, I'm just about survived. Just about got through the last two weeks. It's been a, it's been tough. It's been a bit of an emotional roller coaster, but we got there. You did. Cheers. A wee glass of bubbly to to celebrate, mate. It's because yeah. we've we've not spoken. We've not spoken since damnation, and probably with good reason because that's all we fucking did up to the festival, yeah. and then we've seen each other constantly for two days in an emotional roller coaster. So, I suppose my first question is like. How are you? How how was it for you? It was this year was it was oh, it was great. It was so good to be back, having kind of missed out in a year, um, and just for everything that was going on. Is it going to go ahead? Is Boris going to put things in lockdown? Will we have international bands, not Frenchies coming? The French bands, all that kind of stuff. Yes, no. To finally have it come together, and it to be probably the smoothest run in damnation that we've ever ran. I think it was just it was just a huge relief more than anything else. After us now kind of having probably two weeks on nearly now at this point from Damnation. A week, two weeks. Yeah. Um, it just, yeah, I'm really kind of proud of, of what legacy we've kind of left at Leeds. What about you? How are you kind of feeling about it now that it's, it's I, all... Good, kind of good. I, I have to tell you, I don't know if it was the, the fact we hadn't done one in two years, if it was the emotional baggage of a lot of things, leaving Leeds, my kids being there, it being such a big success. If it was the fact it was two nights or the fact I'm just getting old as fuck, but it took me... <laughs> It honestly took me until maybe the Wednesday or Thursday before I could even think straight. I was like, yeah. my head was like a bag of clouds. I just, and it wasn't even like, I mean, we, we had a drink in, in both days, but it wasn't like we'd absolutely hammered it or I was, I, I had no. it hard on the Sunday, but it just took me so long to mentally get back into some sort of, like it, some vision that was, yeah. it just, it was, it was I think, a bit bizarre. I think it was just, it was just in a good way, not in a bad way, in a good way. It just seemed like, uh, just coming back down for it all seemed to take me ages. Yeah, I think, I think adding in the Friday, a proper Friday, like we've, always, we've done the little small Friday shows before, but having a proper Friday, that just took things to a whole different level in terms of having to be there a full day earlier to get everything done, getting out of the uni at two in the morning on the Friday night, Saturday morning, then back in there for six and there till half two, three o'clock the following morning. Just not well, five hours sleep over two and a half days. It just, yeah, just absolutely. I was just wiped by the end of it. It was, it, it was a lot. So let's get, listen, there's a million points you could jump into. So let's just go chronological to try and keep ourselves on the right track. So yeah. a night of salvation, as you say, we've done it, done it for years. In fact, it's kind of been left in your hands and a, a mutual friend, Paul Priest's hands for a number of years. And it's bumped about various wee pubs and venues like Boom. And uh, there was another one, Santiago's, is it? But, Santiago's, but, yeah. The Belgrave Music Hall has had us. Um, the well, when the well used to exist in Leeds, that's how yeah. it Yeah, so yeah. we did we did 10 of them, I think. So this yeah. was probably the 11th Salvation, or the first proper one, depending on which way you want to look at it. But when you, but when you take away 2000 and... Jeez, I'm losing my years now. So 2020, so when that gets scrapped, yeah. it's like, right, okay, we're back with a bang. Let's, uh, let's really ramp it up for this year, and we'll do the two days. As you say, a proper, I mean, the main stage... I mean, that yeah. Night of Salvation was bigger than half of the damnations of ever happened. I mean, it was like 15, 1,600 yeah. people there that night. So, aye, that was a, that was a, it was quite something. It was quite something. Like, like, talk me through your night. My, my night was, 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 was brilliant. Like, it was, it ran so smooth. All four of the bands are just so easy going, um, which just made everything easier. Um, Orange Goblin turned up, I don't know three, four in the afternoon, but everything was, they, they were just super chill about everything. Is this okay? Is that okay? There was no hassles, no worries, which made my day so much easier. And then by, by six in the evening, before we'd even got to doors, we were all, we were all good to go. Um, did the security briefing with the security officers. That was all fine. And then it just actually happened. Just, it was just good to be able to just actually stop and watch some bands because I don't usually get that much of a chance to watch a huge amount on Domination Day itself. But I just watched all four of the bands. I thought Akakaka were brilliant. Svalbard set was an absolute joy. Rage, or Orange Goblin doing kind of the chronological thing where I thought was a brilliant touch. And then obviously just Raging Speedhorn doing Raging Speedhorn was just chaos. But yeah. me and you went for a bit of a, a bit of a dance for that one down the yeah, front. It, so. it, it, was a, it was a weird night for a, for a lot of reasons. One, yes, it was only four bands that we got a chance to actually watch them. It felt like the most hands-off event that we, we'd ever done. But then right in the middle of it, 
I got a call from Green Long's agent, uh, a lovely guy called Tyler, to say, listen, one of the guys has got COVID, uh, so I'm not going to be there tomorrow. So <laughs> you can even get to properly enjoy the Friday. We're like, ah, fuck, we've lost one of the most popular. Most popular. Yeah. <laughs> I want this explained to me, Flo. So uh, you walk into the production office and I say to you, oh, shit, we've lost Green Long. And you say to me, had the mothers. <laughs> which, <Yeah. laughs> I'm a bit like, it kind of caught me by surprise, like, but what, what? Like, I had the mothers are a great band, but Green Lung were playing this five o'clock slot at a sold out damnation. And the first thing that came to your head was like, boom, as if it had been pre agreed that if that slot was to go, that <laughs> you say that within a second. So, t- talk me through that thinking. I guess, I guess I was trying to think just last minute who's going to be local because Hidden Mothers are all Sheffield based, I think. So, I was like, who's going to be around who might be able to get their shit together pretty quickly and get across to Leeds to do a show the following day. Um, so that was kind of my initial thought. You could have, in previous years, because we've done it before, when we had Discarnate play the pre-show and October File had to pull out, yeah. we brought them across to the main show. But because the pre-show then was, was so much smaller, and very few people would have seen the Discarnate show, it didn't really make much of a difference whether you're going to have the same band playing two nights in a row. Because there were so many more people at the pre-show, my initial thinking was, should we just get somebody different rather than have one of the four bands playing again? Yeah. Um, and just Hidden, Hidden Mothers were the first band that, uh, <laughs> came, to that came, came to mind. <laughs> Second, second choice was uh, Dinner Celestial Birds. But, uh, can, you imagine, can you imagine? So Dylan, Dinner Celestial Birds played like four, four pubs in their entire existence. They've got an EP out and they're going to be like fucking halfway up the stage above yeah. like June and Boss Kelly, the mountain caller. It would have been, aye. And to what be fair, that? I like I liked the idea that you just had that one ready to pluck, but uh, yeah. nothing against to that. I had the malls, but I think it... I felt like it had to be someone that was that was going to take away damp, take away some of the disappointment from losing Greenlong because yeah. they were such a hugely in demand band that folk wanted to see, and there was going to be disappointment, even though people were very decent about it because fuck, it's COVID. I mean, it's no yeah. one, no one can do anything about it. But I just felt like right, people are looking forward to this set. There is a there's twice the amount of people coming to Damnation and there wasn't a Night of Salvation. Svalbard will do a different set. So we had a wee bit of a last minute negotiating with Svalbard's yeah. agent on the on the night. And that's that sort of get that sort of get tied up. But after that, it was back it was back in it was back into it. As you see, Orange Goblin were, were great. But what was uh, what was kind of bizarre for me is that that Rage and Speed Tom show. I mean, I had no intention of stripping to the waist <laughs> <laughs> and getting shit kicked at me for an hour uh, watching Rage and Speed on. But see, is it, is it like when the, the first track started, I would just like... You just had to. I, I, I watched it first, but I was like, fuck me. Like, it really, it, it, I kind of lost the sense of the fact that I was anything involved in the organisation of it. And it just took me yeah. back to my first ever metal show, watching the guys with Charge on Amen in the Cat House in Glasgow. Yeah. And before, before I knew it, I was in the pit. And if you'd asked me and stopped me, just in like... Like, are you, I would never have known that I was part of putting the thing on. I was just so engulfed in the fucking experience of Speed Tom playing these tracks again. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, I was the same. Because once, once it kind of started, and it was when they played, I thought they, they put on a brilliant set of Bloodstock earlier in the summer and stuff like that. And I love, absolutely love Speed Tom. So I just, any opportunity to kind of get down into it, I was, I was going for it. And I think I wasn't far behind you with that. What was... What was kind of quite funny for, for me about it was uh, beforehand, as I said, I did the security briefing with the venue security and the head of the security company who were doing the security. And they were like, okay, so what's, this, what's the night going to be like? Is there going to be lots of moshing, lots of crowd surfing? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I said, last band, you'll probably get a few crowd surfers. And they were like, okay, so what's the deal? Once over and second time you're out. And I said, no, no, don't worry. Just let people come and go. Everyone's just having a good time. Um, and then all of a sudden he sees me start firing over about two or three times during the, the speed horn set and he starts giving me some shit about it afterwards. And I said, how are we supposed to kind of keep, how, how are we supposed to keep the crowd in order when you have the organizers just leading the It, it was so bizarre I, I, was, I was with a, a black pupil slicer t-shirt when I was in the pit and I'd been over, I'd maybe went over once or twice or maybe the third time, right? And I kind of got that tap on the shoulder, like once more and you're, you're gone kind of thing. And I was like, right, okay, no problem. Like, it's good, it's fine, it's fine. 
And then I went in the pit, I said, fuck it, we'll just take the top off. <laughs> and then the next thing I went over, the guy was like, a, a cloak and visibility, just take your t-shirt off and the security have you no know, fucking yeah. idea. So, totally different person, yeah. It was, it, do you know what? I can see why, I, I'm not even saying like Speed Tom are the best band of the weekend because they were technically brilliant or their music's better than other band, bands' music. But see, for me, it was like, it felt like getting into a, and seeing a show or a gig where you're waiting for Mastodon to play Blood and Thunder or Deftones yeah. to play, I don't know, Passenger or fucking... And for that, it was like every single tune was just mm. another absolute yeah. classic, one after another. I mean, at one point, I was like, I don't, have, I don't know how much I've got left in me here. <laughs> this was like a fucking yeah. ice rink. I'd been battered backwards and forwards. I was like, I need to get up tomorrow and put on a festival. <laughs> Yeah, for that for that hour, I just didn't even bother thinking about the following day. I was like, no, just just enjoy it. Just just yeah. worry about worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Like so, um, but yeah, it was absolutely. Great. But yeah, once those floors were wet, it was just it was just awful. And that's probably one of the first times. So I don't I don't know if that's how it's always been in the re, in the refectory. If that's like every damnation, the people are crowd surfing and moshing and whatever. That's what it's like. That's probably the first time in since Mistress, maybe, that I've actually done any, any kind of proper motion and crowd surfing at, at Damnation. I said, that's the first time in probably a decade. It was good. It, it was good. It was, a, it, was a real, it was a real highlight. I mean, I've seen so many bands over there, even great bands that I've enjoyed, but I usually watch these sets where I'm not in my stomach and thinking, what's happening elsewhere? Is the gear, yeah. gear going to give way? Are we going to get a fire alarm? Is the other stage up and running? Is there a problem with the million things that you can get a problem with? So, but for that, for genuinely for that hour, but I didn't feel like I had any part to play other than no. push people. And that's that's the thing when when you have a one stage event. By the time the last band is on, there's nothing you can do. If if the power went during Orange Goblin beforehand, then you go, oh, shit, that's going to impact on how long Speedhorn have and whatever else will have a knock-up effect. Once the last band are on, there's nothing else. My, I'm kind of pretty redundant to that point then. So yeah. it's just like, okay, well, I'll, just, I'll just go back and, and enjoy it. Like, so. Right. so we're sweaty, we're battered, we're bruised, and we get back to the hotel long enough to go to bed for a few hours, and then you say, you're back up at six, I'm probably back up at seven. And we, we're yeah. getting a taxi to come to the venue, starting to be up at eight. And we're joking yeah. to ourselves, oh, who's actually in the crew that were all there last night? It's lit. Who's going to be there really at 8 o'clock? And we just passed the trailer and every single member. We were, we were the last two. We were the, we were the last, we were the last two. two. <laughs> and that's, I think that's just a huge testament to, to the team that we've, we've got who kind of helped us on the day. Like, they've been brilliant for, I don't know, loads of them have been involved for years now at this point. And just, yeah, just, just sheer workhorses all through the day that just make everything kind of run smoothly. And I've said it to them kind of privately, just the amount of bands who've kind of made comments and stuff like that said, oh, thank you for everything. The, the crew were really good, really helpful on the day. So it makes, it makes our job so much easier when you have kind of a good team behind you to, to kind of help do the lifting and shifting and directing bands, where's their dressing room, how do they get to the showers, all of that kind of stuff. Because I think in years gone by, certainly come back, I don't know, 2012, 13, 14, whatever, I'd be running around directing bands, trying to find them where their showers are, and then running off to sort out broken amps or whatever else. Um, so actually just having other people and kind of feeling that you can give over that responsibility to them and yeah. not have to feel like you have to be hands-on with everything is, is really quite quite liberating. Yeah, um, and it's yeah. That you think, and I think anyway, because you, you, it's so difficult to let go of that control but when you've yeah. got a venue with four stages and 27 bands for across the world and people arriving left and right and signage to put up and a press area to organise and press to do it yourself. And it, see, yeah. it's to the detriment of the festival when you try to take control of it because ultimately there's just not enough hours in a day. I mean, you could have the full weekend no. and still never get through the jobs there. So uh, you're right, it took, a, it took a bit of time for Damnation and I was supposed to trust other people to take the, those roles on. And now... That was the first damnation where there was dressing room areas and backstage areas I never even seen the whole day. They were just I trusted the, <laughs> yeah. I trusted the folk that were involved in putting making sure that the dressing rooms are re ready for year and light and the bands and cult never die stage. I didn't I never even had to go there. So yeah. it made a big difference. It made it really added to the whole, as you say, the that, that smooth feel, feeling. And then yeah. as well it was a it was a it was a pretty unique and special year for a lot of reasons. I mean I had my both my kids there for the for the first time my kids were, I mean your daughter's been there a couple of times but that was yeah. my kids had ever been there they're old enough to really realize, realize shit what this is all about 
And yeah. just being back, because as you, as you said at the, at the start of this, it was like, it was okay to say that probably would happen, but we never knew. And it was, no. and, and pl- plan B became like the, the buzz phrase for like, the next yeah. <laughs> all, all you heard everywhere was fucking plan B. Like, are we going to get hit yeah. with COVID passports in the week up to this? Are we going to get hit with any sort of restrictions that might make people know what to come? And that was quite stressful. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of that. And yeah, and it was, it was quite nice seeing your kids there and my daughter there. She was there two years ago, but she was only two years of age and didn't really get it then. So she was four this time and she had an absolute blast just wandering around showing anyone and everyone her AAA pass and, and that kind of thing to, to get here and everywhere. And she, she really enjoyed Svalbard on the, the second night. She was, she was up hanging off the balcony, just kind of really enjoying them. So, uh, so yeah, she thinks that's what daddy does for a job all the time. <laughs> so she was like, is this, is this your work, Daddy? And I was just like, yes and no. But yeah, so that's what she obviously thinks I must do every day when I leave the house and go to work. Yeah, a rock star, yeah. rock star, Dad. See, that was the thing as well for my kids. It's like, it was a wee bit of a, a vague concept. I mean, I, I head up into this wee home office I've got and do damnation. Like, what the hell does that mean? You know what I mean? So it was good yeah. for me to say, look, it, it does actually mean something. You know what I mean? It's like, that there is some result at the end of it. But for yeah. everybody, I really felt, I don't know if we could do damnations for the next 20 years, there would be that same atmosphere because just because it was like that two year wait for so many bands, it was the first show they'd done back. For so many yeah. fans, it was the first show they'd done back. A lot of people had lost so much in the last two yeah. years. Everybody just felt for the minute the doors opened that it was just like buzzing with anticipation for yeah. everything that was happening. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that's probably what made made the day go as, as smoothly as it did as well. When, when people are kind of, I don't know, rusty uh, or whatever, and bands are rusty, we're rusty, everyone's probably just kind of given a little bit of latitude as well, just going, Frank, fuck, there's a show for me to be going to or a show for me to be playing and stuff like that. So everyone just is a little bit probably more relaxed about things in terms of, oh, well, that wasn't maybe exactly right. So, okay, the queues, the queues are a bit bigger, trying to get into that room and stuff like that, but fuck it, I'm actually at a show. So that's, that's great. Like, so... So I think just the, the fact that people were just so happy to be back doing it. And I was just delighted to be, to be back doing, doing it this year after having kind of missed it. I really missed out on not doing it last year. So it, was, it felt really good to be back doing it. Yeah. I'm terrified now. Now they're, now they're moving next year. I'm absolutely terrified. But, but this I year... I've already had 12 months for them. I'm a wee bit nervous about next year. But the, like, so, do, so doors open and, the, and it floods in. Damnation's a wee bit a unique festival for just how busy it gets from the first minute. Day one. Yeah. So we're, we're sitting there and doors open right and then you've got the hour and then the band starts. So I'm like, okay, fuck me, there's people are now starting to queue in to see Mountain Caller. And no disrespect to yeah. Mountain Caller, but their next gig's not going to have 800 fans packed in yet. And then I go downstairs and Cryptic Shift have packed out. It's it, wedged. Yeah. It, it, it was spiders. so busy in there. And I'm like, it was what, crazy. what's going on? What is going on here? So the miss sort of conception folk have got is it was... This was the busiest. If, if you take away the bolts on carcass here, this was the busiest yeah. damnations I've ever been. But, but that actually just wasn't true. Wasn't, no, no, and and it was that was the thing because I've I've had a few people kind of say that to me. Always, oh, it was it was way busier and, and that kind of thing. I had I've even had one person properly complain that we just sold out and we were just doing it for the money, squeezing as many people in. But we ended up, I think, it was about fifteen or nearly twenty percent of people who bought tickets didn't turn up and check yeah. in on the day. Well, 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 what was it? Was because it, of whatever reasons, COVID, or they, they kind of they couldn't fly in, maybe they had any special flights, or maybe they just kind of felt it was, it was still too soon for them. And they yeah, didn't because what, what was the, when I say it was facts, because we get the scans, we get told the numbers, yeah. and it was like 2-7, two, 2-7 seven, two, seven actually two, about Yeah, about, about 2-7 in there. Yeah, I think it was about like 80, it was like 84% check-in, right, or something like that. So 84% of the tickets that were bought actually were scanned and came into the venue. Yeah. And when they say the two seven, that actually includes what we sell over the like that's your press and guests to be sent yeah. out to So and it that the point I'm making why I'm saying damnation is quite u- unique with that, it's like if you're gonna get mountain collar plane and that venue takes, let's say it takes eight hundred people and eight hundred and four people want it again, no matter no matter whether you've what sold you five tickets or you've sold fifteen thousand tickets, it's still gonna feel too busy. And then when you yeah. go downstairs and then when abductions playing and people can't get the rooms. But the reason you could tell, well, especially if you've been to Damnation before, that it wasn't as busy as it'd been even in 2019, is when the main stage was at capacity, you could actually see back to where the main the merch area was. Yeah, it was. That's clear. Yeah. And that was that's yeah. the difference when Damnation's properly 
So, I mean, again, not a bulk throw in Carcassia, but when you probably do 3,000 and you get another 400 tickets for the press people. and press yeah. and everything else, that, that entire room fills. But we've got a fan base that want to come in as soon as the doors open. They want to see Mountain Call, they want to see Cryptic Shift, they want to see Abduction and Wood. And, all yeah. these, and these venues will only ever take 600 or 1,000. As many as can. As many as they yeah. can, regardless of whether you sell 15,000 tickets or you sell 2,000 tickets. So we never oversold. We, like, there was no. less people there than 2019, but the fans yeah. were going to squeeze every last minute out of that day that they could, that they could manage. Yeah, and, to be, and credit where the band, where credit's due, those bands are excellent bands and deserve to have full Absolutely. rooms um, for them. Like So Cryptic Shift were, were brilliant. I, I caught probably most of their set and they, they were amazing. Abduction were brilliant. It was it was really really good. It was they were one of the few bands I did manage to catch down on the in the cult never die stage, and they the room was rammed for them, and they were really really good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, those bands absolutely deserve to have full rooms for full. But as you say, a room is a room. You can't make the walls any wider. You can't make the room any longer. Once you get to capacity, you're at capacity, and there's just absolutely nothing that we can do about that. Yeah. And yeah, like the bands will play other events, and they'll be, I mean, like Mountain Count Call played a Yiga tent in the middle of Bloodstock's main field and never attracted anything like 800 people. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it, it's, it, it's, just, it's just the way that damnation is. And I think after two years, people built themselves into a wee bit of frenzy that they were going to go and catch every band that they could catch. Everything. And they did, yeah. and they just did. And that's why downstairs especially felt so busy. But then you had bands that usually we would book like a, like a June. And like, well, June are yeah. supporting Bosk and a club tour. But you'd honestly have thought that June were fucking Metallica by the like, time they started. Yeah. And we went upstairs to, to, and June started. I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. The room's completely packed. But I know there's a few snaking round outside the people wait now to get in yeah i can even concentrate because i'm sitting upstairs in the balcony and i can see i don't know 80 empty seats so i'm a bit like this is this is annoying me i'm not actually enjoying the set because it's annoying me that people kind of do this and now the complaints are coming so i I ends up i don't know if you know this i ends up walking downstairs to where the start of the queue is where a fist full of these fucking vip (laughs) bands so i guess to the start of the queue and i says how many how many are you and they're like, what? Yeah. How many people are you? He goes, three. And I said, okay, there's three bands. Right? How many are you? You, tell, you can tell when you're in a good mood. You just start handing out free VOV wristbands to people. So I, I, I hand to the next person. And then in two after that, and then three after that. So let's say in total, I give it 10 of these passes, right? But it, it was a total farce because the security guard had no idea who the fuck I was and why I was doing this. The people who were getting yeah. into the bands had no idea who the fuck I was and why I was doing it. And also, I wasn't explaining the situation either. I wasn't saying, oh, by the way, I'm Gav, the, the organiser. This is a band, you can go upstairs. So the first guy literally, he took a band, right? And he, he was holding it and he walked up to the security guard and the security guard went, I on you go. <laughs> and just let him in. <laughs> <laughs> just let him into the back of the venue and I'm like, no, 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 you need no, to put it your wrist. You're upstairs. And then you can go upstairs and people just wandered around aimlessly with these bands like they'd be given like a magic token. And it was, <laughs> it, it was just one of those things because the cues were really, really bothering me at the, yeah. at, so whoever the 10 or 12 people are that ended up with those bands, they <laughs> for a strange guy walking about the corridors. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant! I love that. I didn't yeah, you never mentioned that one to the day. I, I, it's funny, it was because at that point when I came, but I went back up because June were as great as they were. They were, they were also clashing with Man Must Die, which is a clash that you created because um, June was supposed to actually play the slot first, and you talked me into bumping them up a slot, which clashed. June, with- June deserved June deserved a higher slot with more more time, I think. And when you see their performance, you think you'll you'll have to eventually admit I was right on that. I well, I know, but I think the it, clash is horrible. The clash was horrible, man must die. So I wanted to go down and check out a wee bit of a wee bit of man must die as well. But there were so many sets in the day as well that I just felt well huge. I mean, you can go to Damnation, you can see bands you like, you go, you come away and say that's a great performance. But it, for whatever reason, there was a few sets this year that I just thought that was like a coming out party for a, for bands and a couple that stick yeah. out in particular are Conjurer and Bosk. I, when yeah. I was watching, when I was watching Bosk, I felt like I was watching Mogwai on Gear. It was like the, the, <laughs> the production, the, like the way they just had a, a full main stage and a trance. And likewise, yeah. when I was side stage for for Conjure, I was like, mm-hmm. they, they, I mean, I've, just, I've seen these guys at Download, I've seen these guys at Bloodstock, I've seen them play another ten club shows, but 
I've never seen them be like be so on point. It was yeah. incredible. I do. I see. I see. Conjured. Like I'm desperate to hear the next album when whenever it comes out. Um, I I see them if they keep going the way they are. They are future headliners. They just the stuff they put out, just the riffs they put out, are just outrageous. And yeah, they're only going. They're only going one way. They're only just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, Is there any any yeah, sex in the day that you felt like, oh my god, I knew they were good, but I didn't realize they were that good? Um, for me, I'm trying to think who else was was amazing. I, I, I I'd never seen Dune before, and I thought they they were brilliant. Um, I was really impressed with Sylvain. But the problem I had with Sylvain was I only caught the first half of her or their set. And then went down to watch Conjure for the second half. And apparently I missed, there's one moment that apparently keeps coming up on the forums where she came back out at the end of the set and sang a cappella Norwegian folk. Yeah. And I'm, I'm somewhat... And everybody, I'm and everybody just, started crying. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm devastated. I've missed that now. Um, but yeah, no, they, were, they were brilliant. And your one, Catherine, the, the, the from woman from Sylvain, is just one of the nicest people I've ever met or encountered yeah. she's, she's really lovely um, in terms of other standout performances I thought Party Cannon were brilliant uh, what, I'm not at all what about Party Cannon or so let's see we don't we're, we're not a slam death no. we don't book many if any of those bands really Party Cannon were one of those ones who was like okay let's let's roll the dice a wee bit a bit of fun inspired a whole run of merch um, the absolute cracking guys they, I mean they said that Damnation was, just, was literally in this movie's event they'd ever played, they, they absolutely loved it. But that room, they might as well have been cannibal cops. I mean, the room, yeah, it was rammed. There was no, there was no space. I mean, like that room was to take 14, 1500 people. It, it was not, yeah, a but, fucking, yeah. there was not a, a no standing space anywhere. And it was just the biggest fucking party. Anyone that sees that now at any event would be like, they, they're not a band that's just going to be getting off of the slots for slam death. death no. death. No, and no, they, they, yeah, they, and that's the thing, they, they were brilliant, they, everyone was moving, they had all sorts of silly nonsense going on, but they, technically, from a music side, once you kind of leave out the balloons and the inflatable sharks and whatever else, they're just really good, heavy, slam metal-like, so the, the music that they were playing was just, was just really good, the, some of the breakdowns and some of the riffs were just outrageous, but everyone loved it, was up, the room was, as you said, was absolutely rammed for them. I'm trying to think who else I see that would be sort of year and a light are always brilliant. I've seen them like, three or four times. They're always they're always amazing. Um, Carcass, I think was that was probably the best I've seen them. See, I never maybe. saw I didn't see Carcass, so I mean I, I kind of walked across the balcony as we were playing to go and do whatever the I think I was dealing with merch at the at the time. No. So I missed Carcass, which I'm a wee bit gutted about. Which leads me on to okay, my next question was like when you come back, this always happens at damnation, you come back. And you just hear about something really special that you missed. I, you just mentioned the Sylvain, that the yeah. Norwegian um, folk singing at the end. People wouldn't shut up about how good Hell Ripper that set was. Yes, I was just I was just about to say that everyone, anyone who I spoke to, who saw, went and saw uh, Hell Ripper, said they were absolutely amazing. And I'm I'm really gutted that I didn't kind of wander down for a little bit and, and try kind of catch some of that. Because, yeah, I've, I haven't heard a single bad word said about that set. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it must mean, have been good. On the same stage, apparently Video Nasties were pure carnage as well. And it's one of those stages when our production office could not be further away from the Cult Never Die stage. So it's not one of the ones where you can say, I'm going to nip down and catch a song, A Godflesh, and I'm going to nip down and yeah. catch a song, A Paradise Lost. It's like, I'm going to go... The long way, all the way through the venue, yeah, through the entire venue, to get to get dinner. So a lot of the time you're sitting in the production office dealing with some humdrum nonsense. You are just like ah, I never got to see El Rapper. I never got to see any of video nasties, and yeah. th those two really stood out for sort of the, the reviews I've read and who yeah. else. I never saw. I only caught I only caught Paradise Lost after they'd finished playing Gothic. <laughs> Oh really? You only got the last the last song they did. Yeah, they did a couple of songs, maybe one or two off the new album to, to end the set. Yeah, to end so I could have caught the last couple. I was like, oh fuck, I've just <laughs> well booked golf, you can pay for golf, and I've caught two new songs at the end. <laughs> money well money well spent. <laughs> I think other people other people enjoyed it. That's the most important thing. Aye, of I course, as I say, I, mean, I never saw I caught I caught a song of Godflesh or two two tracks of Godflesh. I caught the, the yeah. very end of Paradise Lost. 
and I walked across the balcony at one point when Carcass were playing, which reminded me about how much I caught of OPEF and Bloodbath as well. Seems to be at that point of night, there's a lot of things getting tied up and you never get a chance to really, uh, really yeah. enjoy the... I think, I, think, I think at that point of the night, you have a lot of bands kind of winding down or kind of leaving and stuff like that. They all pop into the production office, they want to say goodbye or whatever else, just kind of catch up, shake a hand for a little while. So you kind of get tied up in there for for quite a bit when you kind of get to that that kind of end of the day type time. You just kind of... Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, I managed to get a copy most of the carcass set and that was amazing. Godflesh were infinitely better, in my opinion, this time than when... Was it 2012? Yeah, yeah, Devon. The Devon year. Yeah. 2011. Yeah. I thought they were infinitely better. And that wasn't to say that they were bad in 2011. They were just so on point yeah um, i mean there was the people that people really enjoyed that that god flesh i mean I, as we keep our office is upstairs so that and the windows are just fucking rattling i mean like i thought one of these windows are coming in at some point because it was just everything was like a table things were moving just with the fucking everything yeah yeah no they but that that's what they do and they just do it very well um yeah so that's that's us done with leads I it's kind of done with Leeds. Well, I want to get a special mention to the three foreign bands. We call them the Frenchies, but there's zero no light in regard to this. Some Pombra, French, and Sylvania, I think, are a mixture, but Catherine's from North, uh, Norway. Norway. But yeah. we had, they, they made it. I mean, everyone else pulled out, whether they're European, American, whatever. No, no one else was willing to take the chance. They guys stuck with it. We bounced around a lot of advice. We needed certificates of sponsorship that we didn't need. Then we sent letters of was it what, paid what was it? paid per, paid permitted engagements. Paid permitted engagements. They were still their agents. Every one of them were still panicking by the point they got to the border. Like were they going to get into the country? It was a lot to ask those bands for to come across and do. I mean, then there wasn't a download to come across and do yeah. damnation. But I mean, now we've had the feedback. They I mean, they, they love the fact that it did. I mean, the three sets were rammed. The three sets yeah. were incredible. The feedback's been incredible. They've got reviews left, right, and centre. And any of those three bands come back to the UK now, I think they can double their audience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I caught, I caught the last Regarded Long Tombra song, and it was crushingly good. It was just, they had, their production was on point. The singer brings a lot of really good atmosphere. They were really, really good. Yeah, all three, all three of those bands were, were good. And yeah, it was, it was great to see that they, they made it over because yeah, it could have just as easily been the case. We would have been trying to fill three very last minute slots. So yeah, no, it was good that they, they managed to, to make it over because they've been knocking around from early 2020 on the kind of, on the planned bill, like it was yeah. deferred from, yeah. from last year, carrying forward to this and, year. So. And tell us, if, if we'd lost all, <laughs> if we'd lost all three slots, would that have been hidden mothers time three? <laughs> hidden mothers, yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, okay. But it got pine in. Or, 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 I, or, I, I went, yeah. a four hour, a four hour hidden mother set. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Ah, it's good. To, it's a good thing I'm here to protect you for yourself and this fucking yeah. festival. So, yeah. we're leaving Leeds. We've left Leeds. So we that, that was that was a. I, I never gave it too much thought on the run up to it because we just had too much else to think about. I never yeah. gave it too much thought on the day because again, it's just busy. But I have to say, when I was sitting in the balcony watching um, Year in the Light, it did hit me. It did hit me how amazing that. Riley Smith all venue is, how amazing the staff that are in that venue, everything that we've done there. And I did feel a wee bit of pang of, oh, fuck, we're, we're leaving something that's, that behind it's so special. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing. I think for the last, the last half of the day, when I was kind of catching people, where people were kind of catching me, like um, Dave, who's the production manager for the venue and stuff like that, and he was like, oh, if I don't see you later, it's been a pleasure working with Yanni, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's at this point, I think part of the reason why this year went so smoothly is we've now, we've now got into a really good rhythm and we, we know the venue, we know the team. Every, it's like a really well-oiled machine and we've, we've got it almost to like a, a perfect formula. There's things that are outside of our control, like the crowds and stuff, and we can kind of talk about that a bit later. But for me, I was like, shit. Uh, for the rest of the, like the second half of the day, I was like, shit, are we making a massive mistake walking away from something that we know very well, that we know the team very well, and we're now kind of taking this kind of step into the unknown, and it's going to be a huge, a huge step up for us, I think, in terms of production, in terms of our expectations, in terms of fan expectations, what we're going to do, and 
Yeah, I'm just really nervous to make sure that we don't like massively balls it up. <laughs> no, Matt, I am too. And as much as I hate to leave those venue staff back, and I did take them a hamper full of booze down to say thanks for everything they've done. Yeah. I have to say, if I didn't know we were leaving that venue and I saw the, the queue for and Boss Kelloid and I've yeah. and Wood and Winterfellas, I would uh, I think I would have left the year quite depressed that we were never going to crack that nut. We were never... We, our only yeah. opportunity in 2022 was to book shite bands. With the only, yeah. it was the, only, the only way you can do it is to book shite bands that people don't want to see to put on those slots on those smaller stages. If you, yeah. if you book the bands that we like, if you book Mountain Collar, if you book Abduction, Wood, yeah. Little Nasty, well, was, or, Pops, Kelly, anything, Kuhn, yeah. you're going to have that problem for the rest of time. Forever. So yeah. there was something about that that just made it like, you know what, it's a tough decision, but it's a right one. It, it's oh, you know yeah. what, what happens in Manchester, even if Manchester is a complete fucking flop, it's it's a right move to try it. Because yeah. what Damnation does now, and this whole 2,000 people coming through the doors in the first five minutes, that venue is not equipped for that out with stylus yeah. and the factory. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And yeah, I've, I, do, it's, I feel sorry for people kind of, standing there and kind of queuing, waiting 15, 20, 25 minutes to get in and see a 40 minute set and only catch the last song or two. And so, yes, yeah, so that side of you kind of, it does make absolutely perfect sense to at least, at, at the very least, try it. The worst that's going to happen is it doesn't work out and then we'll reevaluate in 2023 and come up with a new plan. But yeah, no, it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's definitely worth making that trial and seeing what we can, what we can do with this new venue. Um, and I'm definitely, I'm hugely excited about it. I think there's massive potential with it. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot of learning for me. And there's you a lot, the there's a lot of unknowns. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, like, I, I, I ultimately, you're getting into an arena. It's like, it's, it's above anything that we've ever done, but we've got plenty of time. We've got a lot of support. Best part of 2000 tickets gone. So we've got a, a huge backing before we even kicked the ball, so to speak. So it's a, it is quite exciting. So on, on to Manchester. <sighs> What's your, what's, your, what's your vision for that then? What, what I want to see is I want to take the essence of Damnation, that fan base, that feeling, the atmosphere, the, that friendly, inclusive, everybody there for the same purpose to enjoy the music. But I want to do that in a place that there isn't a million stairs and there's not yeah. huge queues and the bands can get the full benefit of a huge venue. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's it for me. Like that's We've always... What, no matter what band it is, and it's getting, it's getting more pronounced now as, as we keep getting off for bigger and bigger bands, Mayhems, Opeths, or whatever else, it becomes more obvious how restricted we are by the size of the venue, particularly the size of the staging and what we can and can't put on those, those stages from a production side of things. I think Opeth really brought that home to me last year when the fact that they couldn't even put their own lights on the stage. They had a whole truck full of lights that they were using in every other show around the around Europe, bar ours, because our stage just couldn't accommodate it all. Um, so, if you're going to want good sets, if you're going to want ministry to put on a full ministry show, you need a stage that can accommodate a ministry style production. And we were never going to get that in Leeds, and that's where there's going to be advantage. We can put in proper quite large, substantially larger than our main stage stages in there. We can get really good lighting. We can have screens on every stage. We can. We also don't have the same restrictions that is because ultimately we're we're squatting in a in a university for for a day. This place we'll be able to get access to earlier in the week. We can really put our own kind of stamp on it, and that's what I want. That's what I want for Damnation next year and future years. Is that it feels like. A da- it might as well be Damnation's venue rather than it being, this is very clearly just Damnation hiring Leeds University yeah. for, for the day. Yeah. I mean, for, for folk who don't see behind the scenes, there's nothing more bizarre than <laughs> Opeth, Mayhem, fucking Destruction, Life Agni, Dylan just get past dressing rooms, and four students wandering along a, 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 a long corridor that's supposed to be triple access looking for the French class. I mean, it's like, yeah. why are you here? Yeah. Why are you even allowed to come up here? You know how much we've spent for this venue, and you are basically about well, at the end of the day, it's our fucking university. It's our university. Yeah. The same reason that the, you can't get your main stage to start before two thirty in the afternoon because it's our canteen. 
And yeah. you guys are basically, as you say, squatting in here for what, 13, 14 hours and then you need to piss off. And tomorrow the place at 8 a.m., it better look like he's never showed up. And that's a, yeah. a challenge for everyone because it, it does get quite tiring when you're not the priority of the venue you're in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. This And when we met with the the owner manager of the new arena he definitely it felt like chanting him nothing was nothing was a no everything was possible and stuff like that there was you want to do this yeah we can we can look at that we can do those things yeah that's an option yeah we can look at those things and it just feels that there's a lot more opportunity for us as a really to kind of put our stamp on us and and to make it feel like like our venue um i was kind of thinking about this. it feels a lot like for anyone who's been to, to Roadburn, Roadburn feels like it takes over Tilbury, it takes over the town, and it feels like it belongs there. It feels like the, the town and the, the event are kind of quite well woven together, and it feels very much part of it. Yep. Nation doesn't have that feeling in Leeds, and you kind of, you still have university students coming in to do their shopping in co-op when they're kind of wandering around the middle of the venue, and... And, and that kind of thing, and, and wanting to go down to walk and go to, to grab themselves some noodles for their lunch, and, and whilst there's bands down there trying to get their, their dinner for, for the day. Yeah. And yeah, I don't want that. I don't want, I want the venue to be ours and just ours for those day, two, three days, whatever it is, we're going to be in there kind of putting it together and breaking it down yep. without having any other kind of distractions taken away from them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, as I say, I, I think we're both equally excited and uh, nervous about the about what next year's up. But then, maybe that's exactly what we need. I mean, maybe we did just we did just drift through maybe too many years of this is what damnation can be, and that's all that damnation can be. And the limitations yeah. that are here are, are basically we will deal with until until we stop doing this. And maybe that was never maybe that was never the answer. So I will see. Yeah. So that's a. Uh, that's Manchester. That's the future. Now, because it just does two bums on a podcast, I opened it up to the, the forum to, uh, on Facebook to see if they wanted to chuck any questions at us, which obviously they did. So let's take some of them. Stuart Lucas. Stuart Lucas was talking about us in the, the speed horn pit. I think we've uh, I think we addressed that. Uh, and also, how do we choose the bands that we go to see on the day? Well, how do you choose right. the Come back. Just because one question I want to ask you about the speed horn thing. Obviously, because it was streamed and, and it was broadcast over the internet, have you watched that back and kind of watched yourself being kind of thrown over the top and, and all the rest of it? Do you know what? I haven't, and, and not because I don't want to. Not because I don't want to see it. I want to sit down at some point in a month's time and just sit and enjoy the full bit. See, when I came back, it was too, it was too early. I, was too, I had too many invoices to send. I had too many too many photos to upload I just I feel like even I, I naively say to my wife when and we came back with a Monday give me the Monday to get this all squared away and then by the Tuesday we'll go down to our caravan but like I'm still doing damnation stuff tonight I'm still yeah. saying, I'm still chasing boss to pay them tonight saying send me put the invoice Tom so I get it's like over two weeks in I'm still tying up with ends so I haven't because I just not get round yet, but I'm de- I'm desperate for a um, for hotel radio to send me so I can see it. Is it quite, is it quite a scene? <laughs> I haven't. I, I I'm to be honest. I have I haven't watched it yet myself. Um, I'm not sure I want to watch it. I'm, I've been in better shape than I was when I was going through that pit, and I'm not sure I want to see myself shirt off, kind of being been hoisted over everybody else. Hey, bro, I'll, watch the, I'll, watch, I'll watch the other sets. Bro, I'm, I'm, I'm in decent shape, but believe me, when your crowd's off and no one's in good shape, <laughs> you're bent into a you and your wee belly sitting up with your boobs. <laughs> no one looks in good shape when the crowd's off. And... <laughs> <laughs> Aye, yeah. so anyway, how do you, how do you choose your... Um, how do you, there, is, there, there is no really any choice, so how do you choose your uh, band you get to see in Damnation? I will... So some of it will be dictated by what's going on on the day because obviously I do with the, the production side of things. If the day is quiet, and this year was a good example of when there was only two kind of major sound issues throughout the day. Cryptic Shift had some, there was some horrible feedback coming through their monitors, but I don't think most of the crowd couldn't hear it, but the certain band could hear it. And then there was an issue with Winterfell um, when they plugged their profile into the front of the house desk, it killed all the monitors. Um, don't know why that was, just some sort of kind of glitch with the technology. But they were the only two real issues for the day. 
which meant for me, my day was was quite free in terms of not having to kind of run around and panic about, about too many things. So for me, it's I then tried to treat it like if I was a fan, if I was just turning up on the day and paying my money and arriving in at half 12, which bands would I want to go and see? And then it, it is then very much for me just about um, who I'm a fan of. Um, so I'll spend a lot of time at the eyesore. Mercedes is like, kind of like all that kind of the, the big riffs and, and kind of the, the post battery stuff and all of that kind of stuff. So I'll spend a lot of time um, kind of hanging out there, watching bands when I, when I get a chance. But for me, it is literally just about who am I a fan of? And then I'll try to go down and watch them. What, are, what about you? What, what way do you do? I mean, it, the same. I, I mean, I, I go back to the fact that there's never really, I'll never enjoy, the reason why Speed On stuck with me so vividly is because it felt different from everything else I'd seen at Damnish because I did let go and forget that I was an organiser. Whereas yeah. even even the best sets, even the Cult of Lunas with Julie Christmas, even the Down to Escape Plans, there's still something there. There's still something there. That there's a, there is that knot in your stomach that you, you know you need to be somewhere else. And when you go and see bands, even the bands that I saw, Part of Cannon and Conjurer and uh, a wee bit of Sylvain and the, the, um, a wee bit of June, there always feels like there's somewhere else you need to be. So, uh, yeah. In, uh, even the bands I catch, I, I think I caught, I might have caught one full set. I think we sat down and watched Year in the Light. I think yeah. that I might have saw, I, I, I realised at that point, the festival was going pretty fucking well. I made my, my peace with the fact I wasn't going to see Memoriam. And I just watched Year in the Light, and I think that was one full set I caught. But other than that, it was, it's all snippets. I mean, fucking Bosk, as I say, Bosk blew me away. But even that, yeah. and the one good thing about Bosk is I knew beforehand they were only going to play Lira, and I'd had an argument <laughs> with the band about, I felt that was a big mistake. <laughs> I felt that was a big mistake. And, uh, yeah. and they said that they wanted to get um, an older tune in to make sure that it was a more career Spanning set. Spanning so, set yeah. so I never caught all a boss but if Lira was on that set list and I never knew where Lira was, I'd have fucking I'd have sat on the barrier like <laughs> waiting for it. Yeah. So, Not moving, yeah. Uh, and a lot of times as well, I, there's there's differences with damnation like so say I'm a massive, massive say conjurer fan, right? I'm a massive conjurer fan. I'm a Paradise Lost fan, but I'm not the kind of guy that sits and puts Paradise Lost albums on all day long. But I do want to yeah. catch a wee bit of Paradise Lost, and I'm not a massive Opeth fan, but I do definitely yeah. want to catch a wee bit because you'll be like, This is a spectacle. It's playing in my festival, this is right. huge, yeah. Me it's a spectacle it. for, for Damnation. So there's a bit, there's a bit, there's a bit of me that catches what I can as a fan, there's a bit of me that misses what I miss because I'm an organiser, and there's a bit of me because well, it's my festival. I want to see some of the spectacles that's happening, even if it's a band that I might not otherwise be, I might not get in my house to go and see if they're doing their own show. Yeah. So that was a, yeah. I, that was that. And also, Stuart, he's a, he's a, um, a journalist for Rock Flesh, and he actually done a really yeah. good review. He, he was, he, I read it, he, it was. He, it was everywhere. Very good. he covered a lot yeah. of bands, and his other question was, What is it? Oh, so I can get it up. Oh, this is it. You don't get the. Do this, we, this one. This one's for you, isn't it? Hi. Do we get yeah. fed up getting stopped? Is we can run a bit the run a bit of crowd. No. Uh, do you? Do you get fed up that's getting that's stopped? An interesting one. That's an interesting one for you. I suppose maybe a good way of asking you. Did you notice a big difference this year compared to 2019 and before then? Because bef- the podcast didn't exist before the pandemic. So. Yeah your face has been out there a lot more. People now know you a lot more because of the podcast. Did you find this year a lot more people coming up to you than, than in previous years going, oh, you Gav, Gav, yes. oh, yeah. Yes, and it was, it was, they definitely didn't get fed up about it at all because it's still such a weird, weird, weird experience. But what's weird about it is what people do is they come up and go, all right, Gav, thank you so much for doing the festival. I love the podcast, this is great. And they don't introduce themselves, right? Yeah. So you sit there because you don't know that you know me because of the podcast, you know me because you're a friend of a friend, you know me because you're a crew with a band. So you sit for that first 10, 15 seconds, scanning their face and please God, please just give me a clue. Give me, yeah. give me some sort of clue because... <laughs> I don't know who you are. Yeah. Sometimes you'll be somebody for the Damnation Forum and you've spoken to them for the last year, in and out, pretty much yeah. daily. But their avatar's yeah. a picture of fucking Kerry King and Vince Lear. I mean, yeah. it's like, you, you're not even getting I don't know who you are, yeah. And I tried it once. I literally tried it once. He says, oh, are you Craig Smith? And the guy goes, no, I'm Rem. And I went, oh, for fuck. <laughs> 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 After that, I said, fuck this. I'm just going to nod 
when they say it, I'm just going to be thankful that people are supportive and, and watching the podcast. And, and, and I mean, it was great. It was absolutely great. But yes, well, when you say is there any difference between 2019 and what just happened? Well, 2019, it was zero. There was no RU Gav at all. And then this year, it was everywhere you went. And also, there was a lot of awkward ones where somebody spotted you and were clearly ready to say, Hi, are, are you going? And then he stops up a midway, and you are getting like, and this awkward, <laughs> like, what am I going to do now? Say, I am Gavin. The guy goes, well, I never asked. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got the weirdest. I don't know if it was a compliment. I don't know if it was an insult. It was maybe it was a backhand of compliment. When I was watching, regard La Hong Tomber, I was sitting there with our mutual friend Marshall, and some guy taps me on the shoulder, and he's sitting in the row behind me. And he goes, he goes, are you, are you Paul from Damnation? I just said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, you do a much better job of keeping a low profile than Gav. <laughs> and that's all, that's all he said to me. And I was like, thanks. <laughs> the thing is, like, because you're going to get like people that by the nature of the internet, people are just going to be wankers, aren't they? I mean, like yeah. ultimately, I started this festival in 2005. If I started Damnation to try and be some sort of fucking minor celebrity in the metal scene, yeah. I, I, I'd have started 17 years earlier. I mean, it's like yeah. the podcast is a podcast. I mean, I did, like, I, I, I done it to get myself through through lockdown. In Damnation yeah. 2019, no one was asking, are you Gavar Hall, Gavar, this is great, Gavar, can we get a fucking photograph, Gav? So yeah. if you want to talk, convince yourself that I'm some guy that's desperate for you to know my face and tell me how fucking great I'm, then by all means believe it. But I, I was terrible at that all the way up to 2019. So yeah, I, yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he meant by that. But yeah, it was just well, listen, you've been, you've been on here twice as well. So who knows? Maybe that's true. Maybe you'll start that's to true. get there. Are you Paul? Are you Paul? Ah, yeah, maybe maybe, ne- maybe maybe next year I'll I'll, I'll wear a t-shirt saying yes I'm Paul from Dundee. Yeah. <laughs> yes I know Gav. <laughs> yeah. Yes I'm the other one. <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant. So Elliot Brown's asking top five sets now. Anyone who's listened to podcasts I've done and I've, I get asked that question quite a lot. So I'm just going to knock mine out quickly and then we'll go into yours. So Cult Luna, yeah. Devon just get one. I'm and Ra Stamping Ground and. Uh, Probably the agents be Tom now to bring it back up to date. So that's my five. Is that is that is that just in the current venue or is that, oh, is that's that stamping for, ground from back in? Is that aye. stamping ground from two thousand and six? Aye, that's stamping ground for two thousand and six. Aye. Right. Right. Mine. Uh, Cotalona and Judy Christmas Mariner absolutely has to be in there. Um, Mistress was just absolute carnage. So that's our mistress in there. The ocean in two thousand and ten. And the wee yeah. tiny tiny room and the couple yeah. fucking yeah. <laughs> that was that was chaos in there because it was just the room was rammed just as you had all the, like the, the guys in the band literally kind of trying to crowd surf and literally just kind of banging their heads off the ceiling because it was just there was just no room in there. Um so that would be in there. Uh bolt thrower just for the fact that it was bolt thrower and just seeing the venue um that year on and, and how it was, how busy it was. And then the last one's probably mono in 2015. Just because just because I'm a massive I, I have been for years and years a massive mono fan and they're kind of sitting there going, oh here's one of my favorite bands of all time playing at my event. This this feels quite special. Yeah. Um great. so yeah so that's prob that's probably my my five I would probably go for great great, yeah. great choices. Uh, I, I think I saw all of those sets. Maybe only caught a tiny bit of the ocean when they were in that cupboard because no one else. It didn't matter if you owned the festival. You, you were yeah, not getting in that room. <laughs> I mean, it's a dressing room now. I mean, that's the side. It's a fucking dressing room that we had the uh, Alcest in the ocean play. So, yeah. and that was, uh, yeah, I, that was the only one I maybe only caught a wee tiny bit of. The next question's from Damien Norris, or Morris, I think it's Norris. And... This is actually a really good one. I gave us one a lot of thought when I read it earlier. Uh, do you have the same enthusiasm now as you did when you started? You started a wee bit later than you went. Was, was your first year again? Um, first year at it was 2006. I missed the very first year. First year properly involved. Um, I did some stage running in, uh, in the Leeds Met, so it was that 2007. Then 2008, I, did the, I was the artist liaison for the main stage, so... Um, so 2008 was probably okay. the first year I'd okay. say properly involved but yeah um, 
do I have the same motivation? It really depends. It depends on the year. Um, la, if, I, if I'm being com completely honest, uh, by the end of by the end of the last year or 2019, the OPET year and stuff like that, I could have I could have easily just just kind of packed it in. I'd it was just been it had just been a difficult year with a lot of a lot of technical problems um, that come around when you have bands as big as as Mayhem and OPET, and it's not. It's not a case that they were difficult or anything like that. It was just a case of realizing how limited I was in terms of what I can do from a production side for those bands and the bands having a certain expectation of what they should be wanting and me not being able to get to that point. And kind of dealing with that in the kind of the run up to, to 2019. I think by the, by the time the stage, the actual the, the day kind of came around, I think I was fairly burnt out by it. And then and if, the day itself being an absolute fucking clusterfuck. The, the, day, the day itself, the day itself was a clusterfuck, and and there was there was things happening that, that absolutely shouldn't have happened. Uh, I think, if I'm being completely honest, they may have dropped the ball, bringing in their front of house desk at the very last minute instead of bringing it in earlier in the day, which they said they did were going to do, and then that caused all sorts of sound problems, which had nothing to do with us, but it'll be also going to get the the feedback on it. Um, but yeah, that day in itself was was just difficult. It was just a hard slog. It wasn't necessarily the most enjoyable. So by the end of that day and for the kind of the next few days after, I was like, I just, I'm not sure I can be honest with this anymore. And then a, like a week later, I'm like, I'm absolutely 100% ready to go for 2020 again. And then a pandemic came and kind of fucked that up for all of us. But generally, yeah, my motivation is, is, is kind of always, is always pretty good. Next year, thinking about kind of going forward, I'm, I'm absolutely terrified. I'm terrified in terms of just the, just the unknown of it and having to, there's a lot more production side of things that we'll have to do that are, because Leeds University comes with three ready-made stages that are already physically there. We're going to have to build this, this place is an empty, it's an empty shell. We're going to have to fill it with stages and all of the other bits. And so that's going to kind of fall to, to me, or we'll probably end up getting an outside company in to probably help us with that. But yeah. there's going to be a lot yeah. more production stuff inside of it. And that kind of fills me with terror, but in a very kind of exciting way. But generally, yeah, my motivation usually is, is pretty, pretty consistent uh, year on year. It's just when you've had a bad year, then sometimes it, it wavers. What about, what about you? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I gave it some real thought. I mean, his, his question was enthusiasm more than motivation, as similar as they are. But I, I, I honestly don't know if there's any time that would be comparable to where I am right now, other than pre-2005. Yeah. The pre-2005 was a blind enthusiasm, excitement, being 23 years yeah. old, getting into something, that not really knowing what to do, throwing everything at it, but not really quite sure. I mean, there was no Facebook and that, so you're down in fucking Manchester, handing out flyers. Like, handing out flyers, yeah. Metal markets, and, and really, I mean, I'm sure everything that we done we done back then really made them, that first damnation actually take off and come off and book Rage and Speed Hall and sixth and, and just be like this whole fucking new world like what's even happening here what is a backline um, yeah. I remember I, I was clearly very enthusiastic then and then I would have went through years I think if I'm again if I'm being honest I think in the years between sort of 2014-15 up to maybe 2018 into 19 it was a wee bit of a I don't, I don't want to say sleepwalking but it was definitely there was definitely a comfort of this is what Damnation's about and uh, yeah. it works and I do another job and this is, I, I'm not trying to make Damnation any bigger, I'm not trying to make a salary from Damnation, just enjoy doing it. And that's, that, that was, that, that's not the most inspiring story, you know what I mean? When you're, yeah. when you're putting yeah. vessels together and, and you're just kind of putting them together and we, we, like without any deal. And then I think that pandemic kick-started that again. Look, when yeah. you take it away, you realise what you miss. And then this year, I was absolutely obsessed with the festival that happened there. And I think both of us were obsessed with it. And I think that's why it, it turned out so well. And now I'm at a stage now getting into arena that this might become my full-time career. This might be my salary. And when you, when you start putting that into the mix, that this is no longer a game, this is the way you're going to pay your mortgage and, and put fuel in the car. It's, like, like the fire under you a little bit. I light the lights of fire under you a wee bit as well. So that yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I, I don't think I've ever been more enthusiastic with damnation than I am now, but if I was, it'd be a different type of enthusiasm. It would be a twenty-three year old 
uh, Gavin McInerney. A naive enthusiasm. A naive wandering into that first Jelly's rock world without a, without a clue what I was doing. So, no, I'm, I'm absolutely... No, because now I believe as well that I, I, I'm a bit like, well, okay, it's out there. I, it's, but again, one of the ones that there's no... This isn't a, um, subjective. If we sell 6,000 tickets for... And we are the biggest metal festival in Europe. We are bigger than Fermi. We are bigger than Roadburn. We are bigger... Like, we're doing more tickets than, than everywhere. Yeah, so, and you get there, if you can get to that point, with the types of music we're into and the kind of sets that we want to get, well, what's next? There is no limit to what you can do in this Indeed. scene if you've got the support yeah. of that fan base behind you. But that's still, we're, we're 4,000 tickets away for that in a minute. But you might say, oh, well, ah, but you've done 2,000 and you're 13, 12 months in advance. But the truth of the matter is you do a big spike at the front and then, it, and then it trickles. Then it just trickles along, and then you do a bit of a spike at the end. So what we really need was when the rest of the bands is the fans to stick with us and keep that going to to, to make sure it is. So I, I'm I'm stupidly excited. In fact, I, I keep saying my wife to you, even though you know her name's Kelly, but she said to me last night no. when I was still sitting in this fucking office at 11 o'clock, like, when do I get my husband back? Damnation's back. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm about like, well, I might get a couple of weeks at Christmas. Because <laughs> normally you're right, when you finish Damnation, and you can be a bit bumped out, and you can get a bit lazy with it, and you can be like, oh, we're going into Christmas, then you lose your way, and then you next yeah. day you know it's February, and you haven't done anything. Well, I'm like, I'm so far removed from that thought process at the minute. I mean, yeah. I was confirming bands today for next year, and yeah. I, I know that the both of us are going to need to be on it from last week Very to yeah. make sure yeah. that you're, you're getting... Cause because there's so much to be done in this blank canvas. I mean, it's no, it's no yeah. something we're going to do in six months. No, no, and that's the thing. Like I've already, I've already started putting together a list of things that we need to think about that we've never had to think about before because it, it's already built into the, the Leeds venue. So I'm already kind of saying, like, we need to think about this and this. We need to get this sorted. Okay, well, the venue is a blank canvas. We need to find a way of feeding six up to six thousand people. What are we going to do for traders and vendors and all of those kind of bits and pieces and stuff like that as well? Do we want to get? Uh, a separate bar in with kind of guest ales or whatever and stuff like that. Who do we approach to get all of those things? All of this stuff that we didn't do because the like the student union were like, well, this, these are the drinks. This is what you can have. Take it or leave it. Yeah. Um, and that kind of thing. So, so the, all of those things we never have to think about. We now have to add in on top of all the production side and bigger bands, bigger expectations, all of those kind of things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. That, so I'll be, I'll be, I'll certainly, I think in January, probably sometime in January, I'd say I'd want us to be kind of heading back down to the venue to have another another good look at it and really start kind of planning out what we want here, there and everywhere. Well, there's, there is, uh, because obviously the ideal event to go to is here in its full glory would be Outbreak Fest. Yeah, Outbreak. Which we happen yeah. to be at Hellfest in the same goddamn weekend. So the next yeah. best <laughs> option is Manchester Adored in, uh, in, Man- in March. We have <laughs> bands to Oasis, Stone the Roses, and uh, yes. the Killers. So I fuck knows yes. why the Killers. I don't. I don't know what link the Killers have got to the Manchester, but they've got a tribute band as well. So they're using yeah. they're using the entire venue. They've got they've got merch markets. They've got guest deals. So that's something that I'm like that. I, even if we get down before then to see the venue again in an empty space, I probably the yeah. first time we can go there and see it. Well, as as like something that might look through. a little bit like what, what Damnation looks like, yeah. Which, which leads us nicely to Thomas Long's question, Manchester's outdoor space, I mean, what we're going to do with that? The, the, the that, re- that really, I suppose that depends on, depends on how many tickets we sell. Like, if, if yeah. we shifted 6,000 tickets fairly early doors, there's certainly scope for things like a fourth stage, because this, this is the one trade-off that we do have, is we, we lose a stage. So we're down to three stages, but we have longer in the day to, to use I don't think they actually lose any bands. We get three stages. No, but because three stages. It starts early and, and can finish a wee bit later. You can actually get the twenty-seven bands across the across the three stages, three stages. again. However, yeah. we do like to. Well, we use when we start getting wanky and use the word curate. <laughs> yeah, go on. Go on program. We, we don't just book bands anymore. We curate and program bands. Event, event programmer Gavin McInerney. <laughs> so we do like to book stages to fit an audience. I mean, there's no yeah. point There's no point having a nice little merch stage and having, I don't know, post-rock, doom, and I mean, then I mean, in the middle of some random slam death metal band, you know what I mean? It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with the backline that goes in there. It doesn't fit with the, 
the atmosphere doesn't fit with the sponsorship. So that yeah. at, at the minute we have a main stage that's going to be our main stage. Is just always the biggest bands available. We're going to have an extreme stage. You're going to have your what is currently the ISO merch stage will again be probably your doom prog post rock post metal post rock stuff. Yeah. We don't necessarily at the minute have a black metal stage in the way we've got a cult never die stage. So it would be good. It would be good to get those ticket sales to have the security to look at outdoors. But if, even if that doesn't happen in the first year, and there's no any crazy pressure to make that happen because we will book some yeah. black metal bands. We already have rules in the throne room. Yeah. The, we will use we'll use that space for something. I mean, yeah, because would- there will be like there is yeah the one thing that would be good. Other options, I suppose, would be putting putting all the the vend- putting a kind of a large gazebo out there and having it as an outdoor seated bar type thing, uh, putting the vendors out there. So somewhere where people can go get away from the music to sit down, have a pint, have, have a burger or falafel or whatever the hell people want and have it as kind of an outdoor eating space as well could be an option as well. But there's, there's quite a large amount of outdoor space there to, to work with. So, um, but it all very much depends on ticket sales. That'll be kind of, that'll determine what we can and can't do. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Would you would you put would you would you put the fun fair out there because they they've been known to put a fun fair out yeah, there well, every once in a while. I don't know. Is, is that is that a weekend outdoor festival thing? I mean, if you come to a one day thing like Damnation, or even if we had a couple of rapper independent Damnation, well, they, they do it for like the Man- Manchester Adores and stuff like that. I mean, like the waves and stuff well, that they have. They, they'll have the fun fair out there. I mean, those those crowds don't. I mean, those crowds are going to see a fucking killers. Support a tribute act. I mean, are you going to say, you know what? I'm not going to watch Pig Destroyer because I'm going to go in the big wheel. No, <laughs> I, just, I just, I just, I'm just in my head. I've just had this this kind of vision of of some damnation fan turning up and he's got the full leather and spikes, the full corpse paint, just sitting there on a Ferris wheel, just kind of. I can love that. Looking around, best time of his life. So, I mean, I'm ruling nothing out. I'm ruling absolutely no. nothing out. It's a, a large space. There is plenty of options. At, we've got plenty yeah. of time. So, as you say, ticket sales are going to d- determine a lot. But if ticket sales, if by some, if we really get the wave of support and you end up selling 90% of the tickets by early next year, or even into summer, then you can get, you can really look at options and be like, the support's there. Like, that's safe. The net is there to do stuff. So, we'll see. We'll see what the, the situation is. Big Pete, Big Pete Tumpery, who's actually a member of our crew, is asking, are past headliners big enough to headline what we're going into now? Opeth certainly will be. Um, Bolt Thrower. Bolt Thrower could, I suppose. Well, Bolt Thrower aren't anymore, but if, if Bolt Thrower were still a thing, you probably could. But it, I think it really depends on the bill i think it has to have a fairly stacked bill to to sell it's not this isn't a venue where the headliner is going to sell six thousand tickets on its own unless we're unless we're getting to booking machine heads or oh christ i don't even know i'm a god mass and all of that kind of i'm on a mark those kind of bands where they can do that themselves in a manchester academy yeah i think for carcasses bowl throwers Devon Townsend's wherever you need a strong bill from top to bottom to generate 6,000 ticket sales. It's, it's a strange one because the answer like OPEF would be a, OPEF are the biggest band we've booked at the time we booked them but the, the two clearer answers are really Creator and Devon Townsend. The Creator and Devon yeah. Townsend just headlined a 20,000 capacity bloodstock yeah. which is a wee bit yeah. a wee bit of smoke mirrors I think both bands were really clever they, they took that slot they absolutely made the most of it. They made themselves look like bonafide fucking headliners. And now they're yeah. using that. Th- those to justify like, everything going forward. Yeah. They can go to other people. It's very clever, very clever bookings by both Bloodstock and the management of both those bands yeah. to make that happen. OPEF, OPEF would be in the same, for me, the same category, that whole Converge ministry that you would do. Now, this year we could book a ministry of Converse if they were going to go and do Leeds again, but you couldn't book both. And I think if you had an OPF, yeah. OPF would be booked with. So it'd be OPF and Converse instead of like ministry and Converse. Well, Creator and yeah. Devon, I, I still th- I, I still think for six thousand you're going to need that stacked bill you're talking about. I mean, not, yeah. You're not going to put them in the post on do six thousand tickets, but no. the idea of them both doing that headline slot at Bloodstock certainly 
up to stock a little. You know what I mean? It, yeah. Or a lot even. And, and and that's the thing, like I suppose you'll never really know if, but if you canvassed you canvassed the twenty thousand people who bought tickets for Bloodstock and asked them how many of them had bought just purely for creator Devon Townsend. They say you this beast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um yeah, but when you've got people who've been eighteen months without live music, they'll watch absolutely anything and everything. That's no disrespect to, to oh, creator absolutely not. Townsend. <laughs> Uh, but, um, but yeah. we, I say we sold 3,000 tickets to Pig Destroyer and Wolves in the front room. No, Pig's in the, Pig Destroyer and Wolves in the front room are not selling you 3,000 tickets anywhere in the world. Ever. And those are two spectacular bands. No, this isn't a, ticket, ticket sales have got nothing to do with how fucking good a band is or how bad a band is. I mean, it's like, it's just, do they click with a fan base that are willing to go and pay and see that? You know, that so, money. so yeah. I, 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 I could... I mean, if it's if the question is, it means it could are any of them big enough to just go and do that and go boom, we are headline and we're going to sell tickets. Then no, we've never booked a band that are big enough for that. But the likes of Devon Townsend, OPF, Creator are the three that could play the same slots as Ministry easily. Yeah. So yeah, aye, that's that for that. The Steph, young Stephanie Evans, she went to Damnation two weeks ago, and I don't, I've never met her in person, so I'm assuming she's quite small. She said she couldn't see anything, and it was too crowded, and she left by nine o'clock. And she she put in context, she wasn't even salty about it, it was her terms. It just, yeah. it, is, it is what it is. We've been very honest, honest about yeah. the fact that Damnation has outgrown that, that venue. She clearly has a taste in music that is probably round about ISO merch and Cult Never Die stages, because you could watch yeah. everything at the main stage quite comfortably this year. And she wanted to know what it's going to be like for next year. And they would put up the venue layout floor plan. But ultimately, yeah. for the folk that haven't seen that, it's a huge, big fucking rectangle with three arenas in it. <laughs> and that- yeah. And yeah. So there's the main stage you will host. As I said, at the minute, the plan is going to be you're going to have the main stage running unopposed, I think. And these are all very provisional plans because we haven't finalized anything yet. You're going to have the main stage running on its own, and then the other two stages running at the same time. So then people will split off into one of the two stages. Um, I suppose to give people an idea of the size comparison, the third stage, the smallest stage that we're going to be using, is probably fairly comparable in size to our main stage now. It's kind of roughly, it's, it's with the same size as the refectory in Leeds, and that's, that's going to be the smallest stage in the building. Um, so that kind of gives people kind of an idea of, of and if I picked how them big. Up, if I picked them up right on the tour when we were down there, the main stage takes six thousand. Yes, the main the main stage yeah. can actually take the entire capacity of the festival in that room, which which doesn't surprise you within it because it's a fucking airport hangar. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely massive. That that was the thing. I think when we went down March or April this year to look at it, you just bowled over by how big this space actually is. Um, yeah, and it wasn't, it was, they were getting work done, they're having new flooring put in and all that, but it was just the one thing you just couldn't get away from was just how enormous it was as, as, a, as a room like so. And then the, the two other stages are, are massive as well. And what I'm most excited about in terms of those stages is, is the ability to put in what I call proper size staging in there. To be able to put in massive staging and allow for proper full size production for for bands in there as well, I think it will make for uh, a much better production experience for the bands than probably they've seen at, at Damnation before. Because you just have the space to be able to do those things in in those rooms because they are so big. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Yeah. And and yeah. in terms of what folk have had to get used to down the years of damnation is like yeah, even to put up a floor plan for Leeds University Union is difficult because it's in so many different levels. You I mean there's literally you, you can leave the first one, then you go down to a floor, and it's not actually the floor you're going to because that's where my co op in the past the shop is. And then you go down yeah, to the two floors, and then you get to the top of the, uh, the tone stage, but you don't actually go to the bottom of it unless you go down another yeah. two flights, and then you can kind of decide the tone stage. And then you can go down another flight of stairs to the flight left. stairs to get down to Cotton Number Nine. Yeah, it's a fucking riot. I mean, if you actually you need some sort of three D architect drawn for people to see and be confused with, this venue we're moving to is Flash. one level. It's you. Uh, you're at the right of the venue. You're in the main stage. If you go fourteen meters across a corridor, you're in the other side of the venue. 
and that is it. Yeah. There's nowhere else to be. If you're lucky enough, we don't know. There's a Star Wars bar upstairs, and we don't know currently if that's just going to be back room or backstage or triple A or guest passes. But if you're lucky enough, you ever end up in the Star Wars bar, you're going to have to negotiate one flight of stairs and one flight of stairs back down. But that's that's pretty much it. That is it. Officially, officially, it's a Katina bar. They couldn't oh, call it the Star sorry, Wars bar because, because George Lucas was going to sue them. <laughs> <laughs> it's it definitely not a Star Wars bar. It's a space bar. <laughs> it yeah, may have space some... bar. Not a Star Wars bar <laughs> because George Lucas would, would have uh, have his way with them if they called it that. Definitely isn't a Star Wars bar. Plus, also, fucking Star Wars fans, man, are the worst. So, <laughs> aye. Right, okay. And final question. Craig Smith, highs and lows from the Leeds era. So, let's do let's do lows first. <coughs> I'm going to finish, wrap this up. I want to wrap it up on the highs. So, tell me some of the lows from the Leeds it's been called the worst run festival that the band have ever attended is is a pretty big is that low it was truly sass is that a low <laughs> i feel you like still kind of take, you, you still take it a little bit personally um i'm trying to think what else has, has been bad i don't want to i don't want to go back over the whole batushka thing from a couple of years ago i think i, I ranted about that enough but the last time i was on the podcast that was that was pretty bad um Generally, there haven't been a huge amount of massive lows, if I'm being really honest about it. I've loved every moment of, of being in Leeds. There's been a couple of blips along the way, and sometimes the sound goes a bit funny for bands. But by and large, there aren't too many lows that I can really, really think of where I've kind of sat there and gone, this, is, this has been really, really terrible, and I've been really unhappy with how it's gone. Um, I really can't think of a huge number of lows from my perspective. Maybe maybe you're gonna maybe you're gonna come back now and go, oh, do you not oh, remember this time? Yeah, I've been asked. Did you get well? I well, so because they tie in generally with the, the, the same things that you'd say. Like 2011 was a was a tough year. The, as you say, the yeah. Tudor Sash Tudor Sash year. You haven't got them tell Godflesh that they'll get a set cut. Just uh, yeah. it was just that it was a wee bit of a slog. We never. We're a million miles away from where we are now. We were using mobile phones to contact each other. There's no service downstairs. We never had runners. We never had crew. It was just... It was, it, it, that's a year that you can't blame the bands for having a go at us. That was a year where we needed to get more professional, and, and ultimately we did. So that was a, that was a tough year, uh, but we learned for it. 2019 was a tough year for the opposite reasons. We were as professional as well now, but the lift didn't work. The security yeah. fucking had a misinterpretation of a smoking ban. The it was just the fire alarm went off again. It was just yeah. OPEF and mayhem were just really difficult to deal with because they were bigger band, especially OPEF for a bigger band in that venue. And that was a slog and I felt the exact same way as you. They couldn't get that year done with quick enough and I didn't want to talk about damnation for two months afterwards. So they were two years that stick out in that whole Leeds period where I was like, well, if every year was that, I definitely wouldn't organise it, damnation, no, no chance in the world. The queues yeah. are always difficult to see, and they were difficult to see two weeks ago. I hate that. Yeah. I, I talk to agents, and I talk to bands, and they're so, they're so pragmatic, and they're like, that's great. That's fucking yeah. great. Because and bands, I love that, yeah, people queuing. Oh, they love that. They love that. When I speak, like, why are you complaining? People were queuing to get in your venues. That means that you booked it right, it means that the band are in demand, it means people are going to go and buy tickets to their next shows, and I'm like, I don't think like that at all. I don't think like that at all. Like, someone bought a ticket to come to an event I put on, and they're not getting what they wanted they from it. Paid for. I'm not looking at that, like, oh, I hope this band gets sales in our 50 tickets to fucking a Bristol show because people couldn't get in. I want people to get into the, the gig, the, the post. See the bands they want to see. So yeah. the queues have always been... Difficult to see. The fire alarms become a joke now, and it's easy to laugh at. But it's no easy to laugh at when cancer and mold Happening. and fucking Paul Bell sets getting cut in two. That that was yeah. those were pretty terrible. Two thousand nine lost money. I don't yeah. don't like to work a full year and then lose thirteen grand at the end of it. So that was a not a favourite. But the year itself is actually up there with one of my favourite damnations ever. Favorites. And, and the thing is, we put that line up on fucking. Two weekends ago, with a sold it. That lineup was spectacular, but for whatever yeah. reason, it just never clicked with folk. And yeah. finally, the final low, Batushka. Batushka, absolutely. Batushka. And, and we're not going to yeah. say any more about them, but they, they were the most difficult band we'd ever bought. So let's. I think, I think, I think one of I think one of them is playing my local venue tonight. Actually, I don't know which Batushka. 
I don't think one it's is that not Manchester tonight because I saw somebody else posted maybe tomorrow. Maybe it was maybe it was, maybe it was Bedford last night then. Um, but yeah, they were certainly low close by. But again, don't know which of the Batushkas. And, and, uh, and you're just refusing point flat blank to go <laughs> on principle. So I no, um, I say fuck Batushka, whatever one it is, but I fuck Batushka. And so <laughs> let's finish on the highs then. Getting the ultimate high is is the. It's just doing this. It's getting to, to play fantasy festivals. It's getting to put together a lineup of bands that you want to watch and, and kind of getting, getting those kind of those opportunities you wouldn't necessarily get anywhere else in the world. To be able to, to watch a carcass from the side of stage or whatever, or, or kind of be one of the five, at, at the time, one of the only five shows that we're going to do Mariner in, in the whole world. I know they've, they've extended it since then. But just being able to to put together lineups of bands that you really want to see is 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 different. Definitely for me, is the, is the biggest high about it. Is the biggest uh, high point. Um, yeah, easily just that's for me is, is is the best part about it. Meeting, I'm not a big, I'm not a big kind of. Um, it doesn't bother me kind of meeting bands. I've never been particularly kind of starstruck when I kind of met a band. And, oh my god, you're, you're the big, that, that's never been my thing. But just m- meeting not from a starstruck point of view, just meeting a lot of really good people through doing this, just meeting a lot of, like, our little corner of the music universe is filled with really good people. Um, You've had had a huge number of them on the the podcast over the years. Um, But yeah, no, just getting an opportunity to kind of meet and kind of befriend lots of really kind of decent, decent human beings is obviously is a a nice part about it as well. Um, Yeah, that's kind of about it. What about you? What about me? I, I'm not, again. It comes it always comes back to the bands, doesn't it? it always because when you think yeah. of it, it's not about the. I mean, it's been great now. I, I've mentioned a few times in the podcast, uh, uh, like what Damnation has become. This brand is what the Damnation yeah. become. It's great. It's very exciting now to see this, like people latching on it and getting folk being like, "Oh, it's fantastic!" And Damnation will definitely sell six thousand tickets in Manchester. That kind of jazz. It's great, but it wasn't that way for a long time. And it's not really what Damnation was about before. Um, for whatever reason, it, it's become this, like this is what so many folk are into or thinking that, that it's going to be this sold out success. So when we were just doing it and getting by each year, like just yeah. calling the ticket sales out and then maybe getting to sell it but until the day before, it's always been about the bands. So the same, same things like, Carcass in 2008 and looking in that balcony and be like, what the fuck is going on, man? Like, what, what's actually <laughs> happening here? Why are like 4,000 people are crammed in this fucking to see the return of Carcass to the UK was was spectacular. Bolt Thrower doing yeah. uh, that set in 2014. Like, and these aren't sets that I'm saying is like, these are my favourite sets I've ever been, that I ever saw as a fan because I'm not sitting here listening to Bolt Thrower and Carcass records. They can do it the same way I'm listening to. Converge or Dylan's escape plan or Cult of Honor. But yeah. seeing those guys, and then the third one was actually Cult of Honor when you're like, as you say, you're getting that Mariner set and Damnation got itself into a place where it could get that set. It could, it could, because yeah. the, the option's always there for an agent, for a manager to just do London. So we're always competing. Can be done with it, yeah. We're always competing with a forum or bigger. Yeah. We're always commit to just come in and do something massive in London. Don't even bother to ask them up. So it takes effort for a band to actually want to do leads in a yeah. festival instead of that. So that's that's always been great. And and now I well, what it, what it has become and it just seems like it, it seemed like we were doing something for a lot of years that we weren't that despite the honesty that damnation's always had to the fans, when there was never a connection as such. And it seems yeah. to be, I don't know if the pandemic forced that or the podcast forced that or us then doing the forum, but it just seems like there's a real connection to the people that are yeah. involved. Which, with is, which, is, which is great. And I, that's why I really I like, I like that kind of, there isn't that kind of disconnect. And, but that's, I think that's always something we've done very well. We've, we've perhaps at times been too honest, but we don't, we don't sit there. We, there's no airs and graces. There's no pretension. It's just, we'll just say it how it is and we'll, Someone asks a question, we'll give them an honest, straight answer yeah. about it. Um, yeah, I kind of like that about us. Well, that's where we are, folks. That's where we are. So nothing else to say but get your ass to Manchester, right? 
Stop. Absolutely. Stop. <laughs> this Dublin on and this Glaswegian region be nervous for the next 12 months. Get yourselves on to Eventbrite, buy that goddamn ticket, and uh, yeah. I will, will guarantee we'll put. Let me in the lineup for 2000, and, well, let's just say next year, 2022. 20, yeah. um, yeah. It's got to be spectacular. I mean, it's, it is. it's absolutely jammed with international talent. Good, it's like. Goodness. It's a hit with international goodness. I mean, it's like, eh, honest to God, it, by the time the lineup's done and dusted, when you see that full lineup poster and the bands that are playing it, it's top to bottom fucking brilliance. So, aye, the quicker folk get tickets, the quicker they get that security to maybe get a wee bit more confident in Gallus and maybe add an extra few grand here and there and maybe try to get that slightly better band or do something that does whatever, then uh, it yeah. would be appreciated. I mean, by all but, up still, where are we just now? Almost two thousand tickets. Well, that used to yeah. be that used to be where we would get to buy a, a week before, two weeks before damnation. A, 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 a September, October, a, in a year of a very successful damnation. So, um, well, it's not as if we don't appreciate the support that's already been there, but it just it's weird time when you move into the arena that that same level of amazing support just seems to get smaller on the well, actual small, yeah. scale. <laughs> on a tick, yeah. on a tick, <laughs> backer. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've seen that because yeah, you know, on our where we see the ticket sales, you, you sell X amount up to six thousand or whatever, and it has a little bar that kind of fills. Yeah. And then, so in, on a normal damnation, that'd be like three quarters, eighty percent done by now. And then you'd look at for next year, twenty twenty two, because there's six thousand tickets for sale. Yeah, it's like the tiniest little <laughs> slip we're still at the start. And I feel like <laughs> it's like it's, it's quite daunting. Like, so help us fill the bar, guys. Help us fill the bar. All right. Listen, it's always a pleasure. See you after. Take it easy. See you later, mate.